So on that <laughs> night, I was, a, I was a patrol sergeant. I was working kind of in the center part of our, our valley. Uh, I was not at the event. It was, you know, my regular working shift, but we were the in-the-box squad. And my, the dispatcher said, hey, uh, call me. And I could hear in her voice something wasn't right. So I called her on the phone. And we were about to, like, it was like 10-something at night. We're like, ah, the graveyard will be out in a little bit. We'll wrap this night up. And, and our week's pretty much almost over. And she says, hey, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's multi-shots fired at, at the Route 91 Festival. And I'm like, okay, we've heard, you know, I always, we always hear these 911 calls, swatting calls, shots fired. And I clicked the radio over, and I could hear auto, what it sounded like automatic. Now know it's a bump stock. Right. And cops screaming, people down, officers down. And my heart sunk. And, I, and I, I, my heart sunk, my heart broke for my city because I had spent so much time in the shadows, in the intelligence world, trying to stop stop something like this uh, from yeah, happening. working sources and working working cases developing sources of information within our community that would provide these kind of leads that would lead us to an investigation that would stop these attacks from happening and my my mind immediately said this is a this is going to be some kind of an isis or al-qaeda multi-prong attack so i rallied my troops and uh we i did the hardest thing i'd ever done as a sergeant and that was not rush off to mandalay bay because I knew within that 15 minutes that it took all my guys to get assembled, there was a thousand cops already on scene. There was a there was going to be a SWAT element en route, and I was going to hit. I was waiting for the second attack, the second wave attack, to hit the Fremont Street district, to hit another part of our city. And so for about 15 minutes, I I I said, you know, I had some very tough, awesome go-getter cops, you know, like pit bull cops. Sure. They cops. were my the real cops, and they were my five-year cops training my – I had trainees, too. So we were FTOs, but there were only five-year officers training. I said it's like toddlers training the babies. Yep. And the hardest thing I ever had to do as a leader on the police organization was pull those reins in and go, we're not running quite yet. Give it a second. But nonetheless, we ended up down at the command post, and it was pretty interesting because we get there, and that's when that – I hate to say fog of war. I don't like to use war in a civilian policing term, but that's just the term. It's just this fog of confusion that sets in when – Shots are being fired. People are screaming, and emo- you know that amygdala hijack occurs. The tunnel vision sets in. The adrenaline is dumping, and so we get to the the command post, which was actually just a little bit south of Mandalay Bay. And someone got on the radio and started screaming, "Shots fired at the Paris," which is we're right next door to it here at the Bally's. Mm-hmm. They're actually considered like they're kind of a linked property in all reality. And uh, my, my watch commander goes, you know, strike team 13, you go. And I'm like, oh, of course, Vegas, I'm striking a lucky 13, you know, here we go. I remember driving down Las Vegas Boulevard in the passenger seat of the car with my, and I didn't bring all my cops with me, I brought my most tactically proficient, many of them are now on the SWAT team. I, I sent the other one, I sent a, a, a team to protect our trauma center, because I thought if we lose our trauma center, we lose the valley, mm-hmm. we lose the island and the Mojave. And so I remember driving down Las Vegas Boulevard that night, and I, I was wait. We were pulling in front of the Paris right out here on on the Strip, and I was waiting for automatic AK-47 fire to light my car up. You know, thinking like this could be it. So this is amazing. So in the period of 15 minutes from the time you get a call, and I assume you get a call instead of it broadcasting over the radio because you don't want to cause a panic, because a lot of people, civilians, will listen to police radios and find things out. But in, during this 15 minutes, you. You're judicious in your decision process. You stop. You assess what's going on. One of the assessment things that you think about is, this could be a major event. I need to protect the hospital. Mm -hmm. Fucking badass, man. Yeah. I mean, that's good thinking. Yeah, well, I just, you know, our our trauma center is, without it, I mean, it saves so many lives. So many cops have been saved by our, our, we have two trauma centers here, but UMC is the one that I, I always would say, I would tell my trainees, if I'm in the other trauma center and I get shot, put me in the Move car and me take over. me over to the uh, UMC trauma center. And those, yeah. com- those, those nurses and those doctors there, and not to disparage the no. other trauma center, I, I met one of the, the, I did a one October presentation with the doctor who ran that night where most of the trauma victims showed up over down the street here. It's called Sunrise, a fantastic hospital. Sure. I, I'm always facetious. There were great people there too. They saved a lot of lives that night. But yeah, I, I just said, if we lose UMC, if terrorists run a V-bit into the you know trauma center, we... We're well, and that comes nope. down. You talk about the hospital. Some hospitals have a lot more exposure to that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a hospital in Atlanta, Grady. Uh, they send army medics there because there's more gunshot wounds there than they will see in a war zone. Yes. So oh, they yeah. get to tra- treat that. Yeah. So some places are great at that stuff just because they have the exposure to it. It doesn't have anything to do with the quality of care. Yeah. It just has to do with the exposure that they yeah. see. 
Yeah. And, and so we, at that night, and, and we, we, we fly down to the Paris expecting shots fired and hearing things and expecting the worst. And, and, and what, is, what is happening is, you know, I'm hearing someone say there's being, been a shooting. And instead of getting on the radio, cool, calm, collected, uh, I'm getting reports of shots fired at the Paris. It's, ah, shots fired. So we, we, we kind of park on the other side. I, I, I know all the little nooks and crannies from working undercover on the strip. I kind of know, like, don't pull in front of this place. Pull around the corner, mm-hmm. and we'll go into the sports book of the Paris. So we walk into the Paris, all of our, you know, rifles and kits and all that stuff. And I see some lady gambling, you know, with her shoes off. I'm like, well, that's, that's a good sign. You know, that's okay. I don't hear gunfire. I don't see the smoke alarms going off from the, you know, the cordite in the air. And I remember I had to walk into the, I felt bad. I'll, I'll admit it. I, I stole a bottle of water from the Paris. Uh, At $7. Yeah. They're like, they're like, yeah, yeah. yeah seven bucks. I was like, <laughs> I need water. I'll have to come back and pay for it. So, but and another team, another strike team, we met kind of in the middle and I see that sergeant and I'm like, are you hearing gunfire? And he's like, no, I'm not hearing anything. So I knew then that I think we're getting a lot of this, like what we got echo reporting where someone heard, it's like the telephone game. And then we got the trolls all around the world on the internet, self and internet phones calling in fake stuff to Vegas. So I got back and I couldn't get back to my command post. So we kind of posted up at Trop in the Boulevard. And that's where um, I kind of posted myself. And that's where I like, I kicked a certain celebrity poker player. Who, who are you talking about? Mr. Dan Bilzerian. Hey, the security's boning up. I've heard of that guy. He's a nice guy. I actually like Dan. I, I listen to him on a lot of stuff. But yeah, I looked over. I, I'm, I'm standing there with my rifle, and and we're uh, we're, we're trying to safeguard the, the triage center. They set up a, a hasty triage for the paramedics and fire. And I look over, and there's clearly a, a deceased human being uh, with a, uh, a a cover. He's covered with sure. a, a sheet. And I look, and I see this guy in this buddy of his are like picking the body up. And I thought they he's wearing BDUs. And I'm like, why, like, why is medical trying to load this dead body into, like, we don't... We don't move dead bodies. That guy's not going anywhere. Yeah, right. You know, I, I, like, unfortunately. He doesn't need to be triaged. No, it does not. Yeah, he's and he's on the tarp that is, like, it's nothing, how he, nothing we can do for these folks. Yes. This, this color is, there's nothing we can do here. And uh, I look, and I'm like, that's Dan Bilzerian. So I walk over to him. He's, he's high. Is he a Las Vegas native? Or is he just happened to be here? So. All the time? He likes he country comes music here a lot. I think he's got some. He he's got a lot of business stuff going on here. I think probably with his poker world. Okay. And I I, I see him. I said, Mr. Bilzerian, sir, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, We got to get this guy to the hospital, man. We got to do something. <laughs> and and I appreciated it. I said, Listen, I really appreciate. You. And he truly did. I could tell in his heart he he wanted to help. And he I think he asked, hey, you guys have any extra guns? We'll go do. I go. The best thing you can do for me right now is be a good witness and head back to your hotel room. And so, that, you know, that was my – and then I had a picture of it. It showed me on the news, and you could see him. I don't think the news figured out it was him, but but I, I, I had to have him and his buddies removed out of the crime scene. And then I ended up taking our, – our team found out that thousands of the people who had fled from the event kind of ran north and into the Tropicana Hotel. So I ended up going into the Tropicana with my team and find, finding out that thousands of people were back there, most of them under the influence. They'd been drinking all night. And you had those, you know, one lady, a very unfortunate, just very and very distressed, very distraught, had blood and, and brain matter and said like her loved one had been her loved God one had gone damn. down and she didn't know what was going on. And there was, it was she was covered in it. Let's get her to the hospital. You know, sure. Let's get her the help she needs. And then the, the, the drunk guy who's like, I'm going to kill him. Give me a gun. And he's trying to rile people up. I'm like, let's get him out of here. And then I just grabbed the bullhorn because I just kind of figured these folks need to hear something from a leader in the position of government to go, I'm really sorry that this happened. Uh, at the time, I didn't know the total number of loss. Mm-hmm. I knew one of my officers, I knew one of my partners, Charleston Hartfield, had died at the festival, uh, kind of sprung into action, you know, as many, many off-duty cops did, did that night and many yep. civilians, just absolute heroic people. 
Dan. And so I just ad address the crowd. You Google my name, you'll see my body cam footage that is, you know, out there on the news. The, the crowd has given us, you know, clapping for us. And you could you could tell they're very appreciative. And finally, as we started to figure, and then I see a, a guy, I, I, before I'd got, even gone in the Tropicana, I saw a guy that I'd worked on the FBI task force with. And I run up to him and I go, oh, is it Al Qaeda? Is it ISIS? What is it? And he goes, some dude from Mesquite, Nevada. I couldn't believe it. <laughs>